Welcome back to another episode of Shifted Ed Podcasts. Um, today, I'm very fortunate. I have a, a 44-year educator with me today, Ron Canua, who's going to uh, kind of talk about the past and the future and uh, um, how it all kind of is combining together. Uh, Ron's been at uh, Canadian Education Association, well, was there uh, starting in 2010, and now I believe you're consulting on your own um, in your own name, eh, Ron? That's right. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for hopping on here and 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 sharing some of your ideas with uh, us educators across Quebec and, and Canada. That's my pleasure, Chris. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. So, Ron, let's, I always love to ask kind of the starting moments of when you might have realized that education was your jam. Um, what <laughs> if we rewind time a little bit? Like, when were the starting moments where it where educational leadership started to spark for you? Were there moments or, or encounters you had or classes you took where it was just like, I need to get into this? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I mean, in terms of even just getting into education, that you know, I'm not too sure exactly, to be honest with you. So, you know, I won't say, you know, oh, I always felt this was my life mission. Uh, but I just felt uh, it was an area where when I would teach that I felt very comfortable in and, and I just felt good. And, and always the interaction with the students. For me, that was something that the constant interaction and um, where I would even deviate from curriculum, you know, and I would just talk to the kids about different topics. So it was always this notion of, of playing an important part in someone's life, uh, whether it be one or 20 or 30 or 100, but just at least feeling that you can contribute to somebody's life. Um, that that was always the instigation. And um, then after that, in terms of leadership, it was always a question after of, because um, uh, this now we're into the late 70s, early 80s. At that time, the enrollments were going down. People were leaving. The Anglophones were leaving Quebec. Um, so at that point, it was really a question then of looking for different type of challenges. So I decided even to go and pursue an MBA, uh, which I, I dropped after about, well, I completed my graduate uh, diploma in management at McGill, but I, I I didn't continue to pursue the MBA, but I, I realized at that point that I was still kind of looking to make a difference, but on a higher scale, a higher level. So uh, I consider myself very fortunate that in my career that I one can say, did you how many positions did you have in education? And I can say, I think I think I I had them all. You know, going from <laughs> teacher to vice principal to coordinator to principal to assistant director of HR to director of HR, then to a director generalship. Uh, all of these positions, uh, you know, just kept enabling me to to uh, pursue, you know, this notion of, of doing things on a bigger scale, on a higher scale. So that was the motivation. Right. That's interesting. And like, what were you, what was your first big initiative that, and I, I, I maybe I know the answer to this, but that, that mm -hmm. you feel had it had that impact on the greater good of education? <laughs> well, you know what? I think uh, I, it, I know what you allude to, and I won't get to that one right away, but I'll tell you something else that, that did start for me in, in 1991, 92, a school year. And that's when I was appointed principal of Lauren Hill Academy in Ville Saint Laurent. That was an amalgamation of Sir Winston Churchill High School and Saint Laurent High School. And these were two, two very distinct uh, schools in terms of their mission, their values, and how they believed and how they acted. And uh, we were merged. And they decided that they were going to take the staff from Saint Laurent High and bring them into the into Sir Winston Churchill building on Côte Verte in Ville Saint Laurent. Um, and I remember at that time with my vice principals, who had one one had been the vice principal at Sir Winston Churchill, the other had been a vice principal at, at Saint Laurent High. And we had all of these desks in the halls. And, and from the teachers who had been coming in from uh, St. Laurent. Uh, and the teachers had not yet arrived. And the, the uh, vice principals and I met and we said, well, what are we going to do with all this stuff in the, in the, in the hallways? Uh, the teachers arrive about five days before the kids arrive. Uh, so how are we going to organize this? And I said, well, let's organize them first by homerooms and let's do that. So we, we organized the, the teachers numerically in terms of homerooms and we assigned them to different rooms. Um, and, and, you know, that took maybe, you know, a few hours. And then after that, they said, okay, so what are we going to do with all the stuff in the hallway? And I said, well, I know that they, they are somewhat of a different faction and they look at things differently. So, you know what, why don't we just keep them busy and they won't think about the differences, but rather think about what they need to do to work together. And they said to me, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, let's not do anything. When the teachers arrive, let the desks and everything be in the halls. 
And sure enough, when the teachers arrived, they saw all the desks and everything was mayhem and halls. And they said, "What the? how come this hasn't been organized? I said, well, we didn't have time to do it. You know, like that. So you have to do it now. And they spent three or four days just organizing their classrooms collegially, working with somebody that they would not normally have even talked to like this. And they, so we, we did this. So that was kind of my, my first moment of where I realized, you know, no, we, you know, we can do things differently, you know, and mm-hmm. to get a, to get a great result. And we did, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience there and the staff, you know, meshed and, and, it, and it was great. And then, what well, going to my my period of time at the Eastern Township School Board as a director general, where uh, it, it was at a school board meeting, uh, probably around two thousand. Uh, probably it was two thousand two. In two thousand one, at that time, the government was still publishing the graduation results, and the uh, Eastern Township School Board results were very very poor. We were uh, I think we were like sixty fourth or sixty fifth out of sixty nine school boards at that time. And I remember saying to the council members, I said, well, I said, we can't get any worse. That was in 2001. I said, we can't get any worse. Well, sure enough, in 2022, we did. <laughs> we went even down lower. <laughs> we even blow- and, and, and I realized, I said, you know, how much hard work did that take for us to go down? <laughs> you know, I mean, right. it's like unbelievable. But it, that wasn't the issue. What the real issue was is that whatever we were doing and trying to do wasn't working. It just wasn't working. We had the highest uh, level of uh, special needs students in the province of about 27%. We had multiple challenges and there were all sorts of responses, but it was all like shotgun. You know, it was all these all over the place approaches, but there was nothing collective. And then that was basically at that, you know, where I, I said, you know what, um, with Dennis McCullough and I, we were talking one day and, and Dennis had been talking to uh, representatives from Apple and Dennis said to me, he came into my office and he said, you know what? He says, I was talking to one of the, uh, like Ken France, and and uh, he suggested maybe, you know, we can bring in, a, like, um, uh, say, 30 laptops, you know, to a classroom in, in uh, one of the schools. And I said to him, I said, oh, yeah, but w- why why do that? Here we go again, you know, the, you know, scattershot type of approach. Mm-hmm. I said, no, mm-hmm. why don't we do it for everybody? And he looked at me, he said, you're out of your mind. And I said, well, so be it. I may be out of my mind, but I think this is what we need to do is collectively and we need to give it, everyone that opportunity at the same time. And so that was really the driving force. So in other words, crisis, when, you, when, you, when you're in a state of crisis, that's when you feel you have no choice but to do something different. If you decide to keep doing the same thing over and over again, well, you know what? You're just the architect of your own failure like that. And so when you're in a situation when you cannot or you you seemingly can't find a solution to what you're doing, stop thinking the way you're thinking and think differently. And so that was uh, that was from there. Right. I love too that I mean you 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 had a lot of information. Like you get tons of data right through schools and yeah. the testing and so yeah. it gives you amazing information on direction at least. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, schools schools produce tremendous amounts of data. So they're data rich, but they're action poor. So so right. uh, as a result, it's and that's why I'm saying what I find and I still see nowadays in schools is that they're always trying to solve the same issues using the same approaches. And and quite frankly, you know, uh, things have shifted even in, in uh, and in 2003, we were utterly convinced, utterly convinced that the rest of the education network would would have, you know, take a look at what we were doing. And they did ask questions and they asked good questions. So my colleagues at that time running other school boards, they said to us, they said to, well, before, you know, we do what you've done with a one-to-one laptop, we want to know in terms of the impact, we want to know the research, we want to know the financing, and ultimately the results in terms of how did it affect. And I said, well, give us five years. And so, you know, Chris, we did that. And in five years, Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of what the teachers and the administrators, everybody at that school board did over that five-year period of time. And that when we gave a presentation to them, as well as to the French school boards at that time, it was met with stone silence, just Mm -hmm. silence, nothing. No one said a word, not even wow, just nothing. (laughs) And then that's when we realized, hmm, okay, we fell into the old education trap of before I do something, I want to make sure the results are there and they're certified and they're proven. Okay, which we discovered is in effect a delay tactic. In other words, if you just keep delaying it long enough, okay, it'll hopefully go away. Okay, and and honestly, that's still something I see nowadays when it's still technology, and I still read these reports about people saying, "Well, you know, technology, you know, hasn't produced the 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 results we've been looking for." 
the only reason it hasn't is because you've been using it in the wrong way. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it's uh, I gave a presentation just before the pandemic in, uh, at the CLEV conference in New Brunswick in January 2020. And the, the theme of, of my presentation was, um, so you, uh, you bought a Ferrari, but you can never leave the Walmart parking lot. And, and so what I said was, I said, equate it to then technology. Technology is your Ferrari, okay? Right. And you buy it. And the minute you buy it, all of a sudden, then people come and tell you, okay, well, it's really good, but you can't leave this parking lot. And you can't drive fast with it. And you've got to make sure you're going to park in the same way. And you've got to make sure that this and that and this and that and all the rules. So in effect, what you've done is you just limited the potential of it all. So you say, well, what's the purpose? And then you say, what's the purpose of having the Ferrari? So then you would argue in the same vein to say, well, you know, I guess Ferraris are just useless. Right. right. <laughs> you right. know, the and, deduction and, there, there it is. is. Yeah, there it sure. is. Exactly. So I've heard this, you know, and uh, I've heard people say to me as well, you know, well, you know, technology you know, has as as uh, dumbed down education. And I said, no, education is dumbed down technology. Uh, you know, so so that that's the issue. Give give the people, the teachers, the opportunities to use this as a real tool, as an asset, and everything like this. And I'm not saying throw away everything else. I've never suggested right. any of that, but just use it in a way that it can ha- and enhance it. But instead, what I do see are school boards who come down with their dumb filters. Okay, their inhibitors everywhere. So at that point, I totally sympathize with the educators and say, well, why bother using? Mm-hmm. It? I can't. Right. Right. And I mean, we're even seeing that, too, with um, Monsieur Drainville's idea of excluding cell phones from our classrooms, which, yeah. Yeah. you know, because they're a distraction now. Technology has become a distraction instead of a learning tool, which. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of brings me around to this question of why is education such a slow moving creature? Um you would think it would be at the forefront of innovation and, and, and pushing the limits of what's <clears throat> out there as a profession. Um, but we don't often see us at the forefront where we should be. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, there's a, a great body of research, and you can take a look into it, Chris. It's called Organizational Wisdom. And this is a body of research that what they do is they look at organizations to find out, okay, why does this organization succeed and why does this organization not succeed? What are the factors that make it such that they are? And what they discovered was that organizations that are considered intelligent are dynamic. And they they do things such as they value innovation, they value risk-taking, they value in terms of people uh, pushing ideas forward so that there's less of a hierarchy and more of a sharing in terms of an, a sharing of context, as opposed to uh, organizations that are considered dumb, that are organizations that basically don't value change, don't value innovation or risk-taking, um, and they minimize it. So what you have in education is what, what is considered a dumb organizational structure. So in itself, the structure is dumb. So it, it's not the type of thing that, and it's not to say the people within it are dumb. I'm not saying that for a second. What I'm saying is they're working in an organization that doesn't value it. If you want a good example of this mm-hmm. is take a look when the postings go out for leadership positions in education and see how many times you might see the words courage, risk taker, innovator. Rarely will you see that. You will see team builder, good management skills, good communication skills. And as a result, the people who get into these positions are told, this is what we value. We don't value these other things, so don't do it. So as a result, they're not encouraged to do it. And I know a lot of leaders in education and teachers in education who have terrific creative skills and ideas, but they don't bother. They don't because they know if we do, it's not going to, it's going to be shunned. It's going to be pushed down. So Excuse me, after a while, people get kind of tired of that to say, oh, well, what the heck, you know, I'll just kind of survive and cope. So that's what you hear a lot of days. Sadly, nowadays, educators, for the most part, are talking about coping. That's what we're just trying to cope with all the changes, the dynamics. But in effect, the changes, uh, and this is something I'll, I'll move into another just a quick topic here. But, you know, what did the pandemic for me, what did the pandemic show and illustrate about education? Well, what it showed was that before the pandemic, Education had three priorities, and in terms of the top priority was learning, the second priority was socialization, the third priority was well-being. But then the pandemic hit, okay, like this and whatever, you know, for all sorts of reasons. But it, what it did was it inverted everything. 
everything flipped. So now what do we see that the priorities in education and in schools? It's well-being, socialization, learning. Those are the three, and the priorities have inverted themselves. That explains why you, you're seeing such tumultuous activities going around, on around schools now between parents and educators. And, everything. Right. and it's all right. about well-being and socialization, not about learning. There's no, there's mm-hmm. no discussion going on about learning per se. It's right. all about these <laughs> elements here. And so mm-hmm. where's technology in all of this? Well, it's just out there. It's just kind of like floating out there, you know, like this and in a yeah. never, never yeah. land. It's fascinating, though. I, I, I've never thought about it like that, Ron, but it totally makes sense. Um, do you think, though, that that there will be a catch up? Like, because, I mean, there were they look over two or three years of the pandemic where um, students seem to have kind of regressed in the learning aspect of things. But I agree with you. I think the socialization and the well-being aspect facilitate learning to happen. Yeah. Um do you see that there is going to be a shift again where where learning might get back to the top tier? Uh, I, I don't think for a while, to be honest with you, because it, it's it's right now you're seeing the the well, it's it's not the emergence of what I would call special interest groups, but it's the empowerment. You know, special interest groups we've had them for decades in education; they've always been there. Uh, different groups advocating for different things, uh, but it's their empowerment and and the, the political empowerment they're getting uh, is also an issue. That's and and it, and it creates it, it and, and 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 all of this just ends up you know manifesting itself in schools and in classrooms. And and I'm sure the teachers themselves are saying like, what, what in the world is going on here? You know, like I mean, what, how how did we end up in this position here? And it's not because they've abdicated anything; it's because things have been taken away from them. And uh, and I, I think with technology, uh, again, you know what I saw, sadly, what I saw in technology, and I go back now to 2003, you know, because we started when we did our one-to-one laptop. In 2005, we had then the, the agreement with the Cirque du Soleil, and we were teaching mm-hmm. kids online, okay, online between the Eastern Townships and Tokyo. And we were doing this online in 2005, 2006 with success, and it, and it was successful, and it was working. And again, trying to convince our colleagues that you could do this type of online learning, okay, and it can be successfully done. Does it cost more? It does in the short range, in the long range, no. But everything is in immediacy in education. It's all about 12 months. You know, really tell us, ask a school, what are they doing in a year from now? They'll say, well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I don't know. What are, you ask, what are you asking me for now? You know, like, I just know what I'm going to do until June. Impossible to determine. <laughs> well, exactly. You know, like this. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's all short term. But the bottom line is, is that if you invest in it and you keep going at it, if we had been doing this, this type of online, rich online experience and school boards and people that had, had taken it in and said, yeah, you know what? This is a good thing. We should do this more and more. When the pandemic hit in 2020, it wouldn't have been the issue at all. But instead, what I saw was very clearly then the whole problem of learning loss and everything was because of the technology. And I go, no, 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 no. It was never the technology. It was the attitudes. It was the rejection of technology and education that was there for years and years and years. And let's not kid ourselves. We now know as well that another pandemic is just around the door. If if it is, it will be another pandemic and it's just around the door. And here we go again. So you know, we've yeah. we've got to come to an understanding, okay, that technology is a tool that can be, and it's more than just a tool, by the way, that I always call it a portal, and it's a portal mm-hmm. for the imagination of students and teachers, and, and let them go through these portals and, and discover some amazing things that can happen. And with AI coming down the pipe, well, who knows? Yeah. Honestly, who knows? Well, that was kind of my next, my next point with you is, like so we've hit this tipping point right since november chat gpt is launched like what and and i think the gut reaction is okay they're going to use it to 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 cheat the system or you know teachers won't be relevant anymore they're going to get robots to teach us like how do you how do you see the future of the benefits of ai in education they, they are immeasurable they are absolutely immeasurable you know and and when you talked about you know what people say well there's a cheating and everything they'll cheat if you ask the same dumb questions okay the, don't ask the questions that they can cheat on think creatively think differently in other words ask people and, and an example I, w- I was often asked this question okay well what kind of an example and i said well an example i can give you is that think of christopher columbus 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And I said, so if you say to an AI, okay, tell me about Christopher Columbus. Well, you get all the, the data, the historical data about him, everything like this. Sure. But what would be much more fascinating and enlightening is to say, okay, so Christopher Columbus is in Barcelona. He doesn't have his crew yet. And now he's got to convince people to come with him to sail somewhere that made them go right over the edge of the ocean. Okay. Like that. How did he convince them? <laughs> yes. How, how did he convince them? Okay, like this. And you tell the kids, okay, I want you to figure out how did he convince these people to get on a ship with him and go, oh, sure, Chris, we're with you. Uh, <laughs> what's that on the up over there? What is that? Is that the end? Is that going on? <laughs> but you, can you understand that all of a sudden they then build into the history and you say, okay, so let me tell, and then write to me about, okay, where they lived, what, tell me more about things that they yeah. can't get just straight up, even from the AI. The AI wouldn't Absolutely. know that. You know, like this. Nope. that's what I'm talking about. These types of examples. And that's where I always say my favorite, well, this sounds kind of stupid now, 2023, but my favorite 21st century classroom has been for 30 years and remains for, for now. We have 21st century classrooms in our schools right now. They're called kindergarten and grade one. Exactly. Yes. Yes. You know, like this, this, the, these are classrooms and kids, the context, even their environment is so rich, it's stimulating, it's encouraging, it's social, it's dynamic, it's everything like this. You know, it's just that we then end up extracting all of these fun things out of schooling until they get into high school and then we know what happens there, like that. And so, but there are the classrooms, you know, so, and I've had teachers tell me that and they say, well, and I've, had, I've had some grade 11 physics teachers say to me, you know, well, what's a 21st century class? And I said, well, go and visit that kindergarten and see what they're doing and how they do it. Exactly. And they would look at me and go, well, what's that got to do with them teaching? I said, everything. Yeah. It's got everything. They just play all day. They just play all day. I mean, yeah, well, I mean <laughs> what's that? You know, how are they going to learn <laughs> exactly. if they just play? And if they're happy, yeah. what's that? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a funny story. One of my colleagues, her son just went into grade one and he came home after the first day and he's like, mom, why don't we play anymore? Like, it's just like a switch um yeah. and yeah. it just it's it's the rose it tends to be anyway and it's just like and you follow you get on the train or sorry yeah. but this is at the, at the at the Canadian Education Association when I was the CEO there I mean we had done you know the the the, the research an extensive research okay what did you do in school today and and yeah. in there the whole notion of student engagement where we documented we actually documented the levels of disengagement that happened and the profound disengagement of students wanting to learn starting up around from grades five and six and then when they move into high school then it just plummets mm-hmm. and I remember a meeting with Sir Ken Robinson and and he used that research quite a few times and cited it on a number of occasions to say here's evidence of that and you know there's opportunities for us to change these things but again you know like if if there, there's something seriously wrong in an organ. Well, here I can add. Let me ask you this question, okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Think of think of an organization, okay, or an institution that has not changed in fifty years, other than education. No, you got me on that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think about professions. Yeah. They stay up to. I mean, imagine a dentist. I mean, is still yeah. using practices from 1940. I mean, yeah. it's just like go. you would we never go, go there. No, exactly. No. And, and and so that's just it. And then, but parents, you see, to me, sometimes, I mean, as, as valuable as they can be, they can also be great inhibitors. Uh, Peter Senge actually stated that parents sometimes are the biggest inhibitor of change in education. And the reason being is simple, it's because parents want the, the, the education of their children to resemble what they went through like that, which, which means that it's, if, if they went and had a good experience, good for the kids. If they had a bad experience, and I've had parents say this to me, you know, and, uh, as a matter of fact, in Manitoba at a conference with parents, one parent stood up there and said to me, you know, I went through high school and it was hell, so my kid's going to go through it too. <laughs> well, you know, what's that saying? Well, you know, yeah. yeah, you know, like that. So as a result, you you know, like you you have this context, but you parents have a say in terms of like giving what I what I would consider hearing what they have to say is important. It's always important, yes. I think. On the other hand, it doesn't mean that they're the ones who decide how to do it like that. And and that's where I kind of draw the line to separate, you know, like this, because I still have parents always still saying to me, you know, Pooh, I wouldn't want to be a teacher. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. But you're willing to tell them what to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> do how they did it when I was young. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, even our pre-service teachers as well tend to get a similar style presented to them. And then, I mean, what else do they know? They know what yeah. they know. Yeah. So they go yeah. into you know it's yeah and i do think some of the big 
changes. Like when Quebec here turned to competency based, again, yeah. it was parents not understanding what that meant. And yeah. they had to roll that back, which was so unfortunate. Because Absolutely. Absolutely. It, that, that was a great example of lousy communications. And I remember even yeah. speaking with the deputy minister at one time and saying, you know, this, this uh, innovative reform is done by improvisation. And I said, that's what I'm getting from you guys. Everything seems to be improvised. I mean, I remember, I forget what year it was, 2004, 2005. No, 2004, I think. It's, you know, in mid-September, you know, people were kind of going like tapping their fingers on the desk and going, there's something missing here. What are we forgetting to do here? What are you like that? And then at the end of September, someone realized that, oh, wait a second, we forgot to put out the grids for the report cards. That actually happened. You know, and I remember the principals, you know, even asking me and saying, any news about the report cards, what they're going to look like? And we're going like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so, well. so all of these things hampered exactly, as you said, the credibility. And so I don't blame parents. In Sherbrooke, the Chamber of Commerce invited me once to speak there to explain to the parents the reform. There was a good thousand people in there. I asked them, mm. put their hands up. How many of you people believe in the reform and competency based? OK, the whole notion of student self-appraisal and everything like this. And it was maybe about a third of them had their hands up and said, okay, you know, and the rest was like, that fast, no. I said, okay, give me an hour and I'll explain it to you. And if, you know, tell me what you think after that. Well, after an hour, I explained to them all the things and I threw away all of the misinterpretations and, you know, and, um, and, and well, I would say like you know, bad, bad ideas about it all. And then mm -hmm. I asked, I said, let's do another vote. And it was about three quarters that said, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. now we get it. Now we understand. So it's not throwing this out and it's not throwing that. I said, no, it's not. It's none of that. And that's why. So communication in education is so important. And yeah, um, when you're looking at change in education, you're looking at technology in education, for the most part, it's been poorly, poorly communicated. Well, thanks to people like you, um, the communication, the messages get out there. Um I want to thank you for this, Ron. It's been a real treat. And I mean, your mindset has been shared. I mean, it's a part of me as well, um, just well, through working you. with That's you very kind and of you. getting chances to talk with you and work with you, really. Um, yeah. Just to preface, Ron and I worked at ETSB during the one-on-one, -on -one, so yeah, people yeah. have a context of what we're talking about. But um, it was it was a great initiative. I always believed in it, and I still believe in that engagement is key. And yeah. if all of school could be like kindergarten. Wow. Yeah. That would be something else. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, well you take you. care, Ron. Thanks so much for hopping on with me. And um, I wish you all the best. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks a lot, Chris. Take care.